Friends, uh, a very warm welcome to this evening and uh, to the first of uh, a new series that we're calling Kingston Faith Talks. Um, that's why we're scrabbling around because we haven't done this before, so we're, we're still getting used to the, the format and the setup and everything else, so uh, we beg your indulgence for that. But uh, it's wonderful to see uh, so many of you here uh, this evening. Um, I'm delighted uh, that we can gather. I I'm also delighted that we're live streaming this, so hopefully uh, there'll be people watching this at home or maybe at, at a later date. Uh, our intention uh, in organising these faith talks is, uh, is to help people think about uh, current affairs, um, to think about the issues that really matter, and uh, to bring in a faith perspective. So we're hoping for uh, intelligent discussion uh, with uh, a lot of uh, respect and good listening um, and uh, to bring people together uh, perhaps of uh, differing opinions uh, both within the church and beyond the church um, and, to, uh, and to sort of uh, th enable us to, to think a bit more deeply about uh, some of these complex issues. And tonight uh, we've started with a, with a, with a good hot potato uh, which is uh, about uh, climate change. I'm not sure that's such a hot potato anymore, but uh, whether civil disobedience is justified by the urgency of the climate crisis. And I'm delighted uh, that we've got a wonderful panel this evening and our main speaker, Ruth Valerio, who will, um, who will I'm sure, uh, educate us and lead us into a good debate. But I'm also really pleased uh, that uh, we have. Um, sorry, I've just realised I'm standing in front of a yellow light. <laughs> <laughs> that we have um, been uh, encouraged and very much, I think, sponsored uh, by Bishop Martin, uh, who is uh, not just sponsoring us, but uh, very much leading and chairing this evening. So, Bishop Martin. Uh, over to you in a second. I've just realised I just need to do two practical things, uh, which is firstly to say that the toilets are in that corner over there, if you uh, wish, um, and also that we aim to finish about 8 o'clock this evening, but if you do need to leave earlier than that, of course, please just uh, slip out either way. So over to you, uh, Bishop Martin. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everyone. It's really good to be with you tonight. Um, I've not been Bishop Kingston very long, but in two days' time I would have been Bishop Kingston for 12 months. So that feels like an important landmark. Um, I've come from Bristol, in Bristol Diocese before I came to Southwark. Um, I played a part both in Bristol and nationally in terms of trying to encourage the church to be more ambitious around the climate and ecological crisis, particularly in the Church of England's General Synod. Um, I'm lead bishop for the environment in Southwark Diocese, so having a role overseeing the work that we're doing as a diocese. And prior to becoming a bishop, I was professor of development politics at the University of Bristol. So I have a background in international development and politics. So that's me. Um, we have a very accomplished panel, an interesting panel this evening, and they all have lots of strings to their bow, which I think will come out in our conversation, I hope it will. So firstly, I'll welcome to our speaker, Dr. Ruth Valerio, environmentalist, theologian, social activist, and author. And then um, in the middle there is uh, Reverend Sue Parfit, a retired priest from Bristol Diocese, um, an activist with XR in Great Britain, and also an author. I think probably everyone on the panel is an author, I was reflecting. And then Reverend Dr. Sharon Morton here is a theologian and Old Testament scholar and vicar of St. Mary's Eco Church in North Lambeth, Lambeth, which has the distinction of principally meeting in a park. That's correct, isn't it? But it's a bit of a shift. A bomb church. A bomb church, okay, yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's moving on. Um, and then Father Martin Hislop uh, on my left is vicar of St. Luke's Kingston, so local. Um, and Deputy Chairman of London Conservatives. And I didn't know this about you, Martin, but uh, prior to your ordination in Australia, you had a career in Aboriginal Affairs, political service, and academia. So I'm sure you've got some publications under your belt as well. So 
So that's our panel. What a great panel it is. Please give them a round of applause. So let me sort of tell you how, how this evening is going to run. We're going to hear from Ruth first, and, and Ruth will speak for about half an hour. Um, then I'll give each of the panelists five minutes to respond either in terms of what Ruth has said, reaction to what Ruth has said, or, or more specifically their angle on tonight's theme, or perhaps both. And then I might ask the panelists a, a couple of questions myself before opening up to, your, to you, the audience, for, um, for questions. Um, and Joe, you're going to help me um, receive questions and see how we get on there. Um, and just to echo um, what Joe said at the beginning, uh, yes, we are. We know we're in an election year. I think we know we're in an election year. Um, we're really hoping that through this we'll get some um, good listening, um, respectful listening, uh, disagreeing well, being open to learn, um, perhaps being open to seeing things differently. Um, and I want to really stress the importance um, of learning from each other. So I hope we'll all learn something and our reflect reflecting and understanding these issues will, will deepen as a result of tonight. Um, so I will hand over to Ruth. The floor is yours. after a blessing by the bishop and an urgent call for non-violence, more than 2,000 people walked out of the St. Nicholas Church Leipzig in what was then East Germany. They were met both by uniformed police who had been attempting to close the church for many years, for many months, sorry, and by tens of thousands of others who were waiting outside the church with candles in their hands. It's been said that two hands are needed to carry a candle, one to carry it and one to protect it from going out. And in this way, if you're carrying a candle, you can't also carry stones or clubs at the same time. This was a pivotal moment for the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the dictatorship that had caused so much misery and death, repression and brutality and hardship. It goes back, this moment goes back to a few years before, the years leading up to 1989, when peaceful prayer services became a regular part of the life of St. Nicholas Church. It began with just a handful of people, but then grew into a fundamental part of the movement against the dictatorship. The church became a place where people could gather to discuss the urgent social problems of their time and to pray to God for support and guidance. And as the movement grew, so it also became infiltrated by Communist Party members. And they ended up hearing the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount every week, week by week. In fact, 600, they think 600 of the people in the church listening to the bishop on that night of October the 9th. 600 of those, they think, were Stasi members listening to the bishop preach on the Sermon on the Mount. Just two days before that, there'd been a, a hideous show of force by the police as hundreds of defenceless people were beaten and taken away, but still the people flocked to the church, determined to continue their prayerful stand. And the result was a movement that brought down the dictatorship. The military and the police became engaged in conversations and withdrew, and there wasn't a single shattered window. Where should this point to? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that looks all right. Syndrome. 
Gentleman, who was a member of the Central Committee of the ruling party, said, we'd planned everything, we were prepared for everything, but not for candles and prayers. It's really good to be here this evening and to talk with you about this vital, vital topic of the climate emergency that we're facing. And for us then to consider together is peaceful civil disobedience justifiable in the face of the emergency that we're, that we're facing? We haven't seen, maybe we haven't seen so much of that in our papers recently. We've gone through waves, haven't we, of non-violent direct action, some of which hits the media, some of it doesn't. And yet it's still so relevant to us because we've just been hearing over the last couple of weeks, how last year was the warmest year on record. And just over, over January, we know that we have had some days that have been the warmest January day on record. And in fact, last year, I don't quite know if I'm going to say this right, every single day of last year broke a record. Last year was just shattered all of the temperature graphs that we have had up until now. And so what is our response as Christians? Should we be out on the streets? Should we be getting engaged in civil disobedience? How should we be responding? And I want to frame what I say within a, a biblical narrative to help our thinking. I want to start by locating the question firmly within the theological framing of what I would call holistic or integral mission. In fact, might better call that integral or holistic gospel. I could talk on this for a long time and I'm not going to but when I look at the scriptures, I see a basic framework that is based around a relational understanding of what the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is. That we were created, right at the beginning in Genesis 1, we were created to be in relationship. To be in relationship with God, with other people, with the wider natural world, and with ourselves. And the fall, if you read Genesis 3, the fall broke those relationships. It broke our relationship with God, with each other, and with the wider world. And then the scriptures really is the story of God working to put back to rights those broken relationships. We're probably used to seeing the Hebrew scriptures as the story of the people's relationship, broken relationship with God and how God works through the, through the prophets, through the leaders, through the laws, to try and through the sacrificial system to put that back to rights. But it's also, the Hebrew scriptures are also the story of our broken relationship with each other. And you see that the laws have been put there not only to provide reparation when people sin before God, but also the reparation of when they sin between each other and when those relationships are broken. And weaving all the way through that is the constant theme of the people's relationship with the land. You have this triangle in the Hebrew scriptures of God, the people and the land and how people treat the land, treat the natural world, treat the other creatures that God has created is an integral part of how the people work out their relationship with God and their relationship with one another. And you see that then going through into the life and the ministry of Jesus, into the early church and into our ultimate hope of what we look forward to. There's so much in that that I could unpack, which, which I'm not going to. But it is to say that the good news of Jesus isn't only about our individual relationship with God, as important as that is, but the good news of Jesus is that our relationship also with others is restored. 
and our relationship with the wider natural world is restored. The whole of God's creation is part of his, of God's plans for salvation. And then our relationship with self is also restored. And what this means, therefore, is that we can't divide preaching from social action, from environmental care. You can't divide the physical from the spiritual. You can't argue over which is most important. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, calls us to hold all of these things together. And as Christians, we are called to witness to the good news of Jesus by working with him in the power of the Holy Spirit for the common good, to see human flourishing, and indeed to see the flourishing of the whole created order. When, it, when we look at the climate crisis, we see that we are most definitely not seeing either humans or the wider natural world flourishing. At Tear Fund, we hear every day the devastating impact that the climate crisis is having on the lives of people living in poverty. Tear Fund has been taking action on climate change for over 30 years. Why? Uh, actually not because of scientific reports, because the people who we serve in the communities where we work in some of the poorest countries in the world started to tell us that something was happening. Something was going wrong. The rains weren't coming. And when they did, they came so strong that they then washed away all of, their, all of the things that they were growing. And our community started talking about extreme weather uh, events, seeing more flooding, more drought, more starvation, children not able to go to school, young girls married off at even earlier ages into terrible marriages because the families couldn't afford to keep them and so on. But uh, alongside the, what we see coming through from the communities that we work with, we know that there has been a steady stream of scientific reports also confirming what at Tifon we see on the ground. Uh, you, I'm sure you'll be aware of the work of the IPCC and uh, they just last year brought out their, their sixth report. It was the final report in a, <coughs> excuse me, a series that they've been doing. And in 2022, they brought out this one, looking at the impacts of climate change and how to help communities adapt and at the vulnerability that the climate crisis is leading to. I can't do justice to these reports. But I will tell you about a, a prayer meeting that I'm involved with, with, um, with Christians who are environmental leaders and leaders of different environmental organisations. And one of the people there who's part of the <coughs> prayer meeting is called Mike Moorcroft. He's from Natural England and he's one of the lead authors for the IPCC. And his conclusion, just as we sort of talked together to pray, was that any further delay in concerted, anticipatory global action on adaptation and mitigation will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. And that was one of the things that he wrote in the conclusion. And I'm not going to read through all of those, but those were some of the bullet points from the report there. The reports are clear that we're not on track for 1.5 degrees, and let's remember even 1.5 degrees is a disaster. And we're currently at about 1.3-ish, depending, and, and we're seeing disaster, aren't we? So really, 1.5 is even worse. So 1.5 degrees C of warming is not a panacea, and it's not saying, oh, actually, it's fine, we can get to that and it will be okay. We, we need no more warming, but 1.5 is what has been set and is part of the talks. But we're not on track for that, and the window of opportunity is closing. We need rapid deep, sustained cuts in emissions 
Fossil fuel must be phased out and we must focus on a just transition to renewable energy. But we're not seeing that happen. The UK has made a, a number of steps forward. There, there have been some climate commitments with ambitious targets, but we are currently way off track. And you will know last year we saw the government rolling back on some of its key environmental pledges. And also the Labour government is now starting to say if they come into power, they're not sure they're going to keep up with the commitment that they had made around the amount that they were going to spend. So this isn't about party politics, and I want to be really clear on that. This is a, a, this is a crisis that is overwhelming and will, will overwhelm all of us, whatever party we are from. Uh, Mike Moorcroft, my friend from Natural England, said, this is interpreting the facts. It's not a political opinion. This isn't an opinion, it's an evidence statement. So then how, as Christians, do we respond when we see that the common good and the flourishing of all creation is being destroyed? I want to come to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, just going back to my theme of the, the Second World War. Um, and he talked about three different areas by which we can take action. The first is to aid the victim. And this is something we're heavily involved with at Tear Fund in our work to help people lift themselves out of poverty in some of the poorest countries of the world. I think of communities in Malawi where we're supporting local churches to teach people how to grow their food in ways that protect the environment and are more climate resilient. This is Beatrice, who's a grandmother in central Malawi and one of the communities that we work with. And we help them to increase their crops and give families enough food to feed themselves and, and enough so they can sell and give an income. So when we think of responding to the climate crisis, Helping those who are victims of it is one step, is one part of that. And supporting organisations that are involved in doing that is a really practical way by which we can respond ourselves. But it doesn't stop there. Bonhoeffer's second point was speaking truth to power. And again, this is something that we're involved with at Tear Fund through our advocacy and campaigning work. And we're involved in coalitions with a number of other organisations in, in the UK and around the world, pushing governments and companies to be delivering on their climate targets. And we can work within the system as well. I think of a friend of mine who's head of public sector decarbonisation at the en en Energy and Industry um, Government Department and another friend who's working on climate change for the Greater London Authority, another friend <coughs> of mine who's heading up RSP, the RSPB's work on climate and farming. We know that farming is a big contributor to the climate crisis. So there's lots that we can do to speak truth to power. But then we have this third area. Bonhoeffer was clear that sometimes the role of the church isn't just or isn't only to bandage the victims under the wheel, but sometimes we are to drive a spoke into the wheel itself. And this for me is where tactics and actions of disruption come in. I think that non-violent direct action is part of the toolkit for bringing about change. And research shows that nonviolent direct action actually has the best chance of creating change. The nonviolent bit is really important, and I do absolutely want to stress that. The title for this evening didn't have that nonviolent peaceful bit in it. It was just this civil disobedience um, justifiable. For me, it has to have the, the nonviolent peaceful bit there. And uh, we know that when faced with emergencies and injustices, 
Anger can quickly turn violent, and that's understandable, but I want us to focus on the peaceful part. History is full of incidents where those seeking change turn to violence to get their way, but actually there's research that has shown over the last century non-violent resistance movements have been about twice as effective as violent ones. Disruption targets get noticed. You think, whether you think it's for ill or for good, you think of all the media attention that happens when there are climate protests that involve civil disruption. Think of Greta Thunberg before COVID. You, Think of the, the movement that she was starting. You think of XR and the debate and the discussion that was happening in the media because of that. I've been campaigning on the climate crisis for years. And I would say, where has it got me? Well, in all humility, I think that the, the civil disruption has brought about more change and taken things further than I have managed in my years of doing regular campaigning. Sometimes disruption pushes those in power to make changes because the cost of the disruption exceeds the cost of doing what's demanded. That's why people strike, isn't it? And yes, disruption is annoying and it can be upsetting. I really understand that. Those taking part would liken it to the disruption of the warning bell when the Titanic uh, was going down, the warning bell that the captain of the Titanic used. And it changes the public narrative, it opens up the conversations and provokes people to take their own actions. There's, oh sorry, I should have put that one up before. But I do want to say we don't have to have a one-size-fits-all attitude. So there are different types of civil disruption and non-violent direct action. Um, and so I'm not painting a, um, a blanket picture around that. And there are some areas that we will feel more or less comfortable with. But I'm looking at the, the principle of peaceful civil disobedience. There's a long history of peaceful civil disobedience within the Christian faith. You think of the civil rights movement, the Quakers, the Catholics in Latin America, the liberation theology, stretching right back to the scriptures. Remember that the earliest Christians were a subversive minority group who refused to acknowledge anyone as Lord except Jesus Christ and they paid the consequences for doing so. I sometimes think of Rosa Parks sitting on that bus. Can you imagine if the Daily Mail had been around at that time? What would they have been saying? Oh, innocent people just trying to get home from work, disrupting their time. They would have been hard-working people who needed to get home for their dinner. And yet, look at what she was able to achieve. And there are many examples through scripture pointing to a principle of non-violence against the governing authorities and of people who chose to obey God rather than human authorities. Think of the Hebrew midwives, Daniel, Peter and John when they were forbidden to preach. Think of Elijah's running battle with Ahab. Some of Jesus' examples, the teachings in Proverbs and Romans, Jeremiah, some of the strange things that Ezekiel did to disrupt things. Yes, Christians are to be law-abiding, but where the law would compel us to compromise our faith, then in Acts 5, it's clear that we must obey God rather than human beings. So in the face of injustice, we mustn't be meekly silent. But as Proverbs 31 tells us, we must speak up for those who can't speak for themselves and defend the rights of the poor and needy. Romans 13 is a passage that's often used in defence of Christians submitting to authorities and against pra practising civil disobedience. 
There's an interesting perspective on Romans 13 that's articulated by Martin Newell, who's a Catholic priest and a direct action activist. And he points out that Paul calls us to submit to authorities, not necessarily to obey them. So we're called to act in the same way as Jesus and the early disciples, who submitted to the authorities. They broke the law, but then faced the consequences and took the punishment. And the churches of South Africa also struggled with this issue and with Romans 13. And they insisted on understanding that the text be seen within the wider context of the Bible, where God does not demand obedience to oppressive rulers, but instead demands that we follow his values. And let's not forget, too, that Romans 13 was actually written while Paul himself was in prison. In Revelation 13, we have the beast as a contrasting image of governing authorities to the servant of God in Romans 13. Romans 13 suggests a relatively benign state, and Paul is clearly anxious that the Christians aren't seen as, as subversive revolutionaries in the context that he was writing into. But in the face of persecution that we have in, in Revelation 13, there seems to be a more appropriate response into that situation. And the question for us is, when does the state tip from being the, the benevolent servant of Romans 13 into the beast that must be resisted in Revelation 13? It can be both, of course, and we're called to discern and to be prepared to act. To return to South Africa, a letter from Alan Bursak, who was a South African pastor, refers to a warning that he says the minister has given the churches of South Africa. The South African minister told the churches to confine themselves to their proper task, the preaching of the gospel. And Bursak was clear that preaching the gospel is about preaching the lordship of Christ over all spheres of life, and that where human laws are in conflict with the gospel, then our mandate to preach it in a holistic, active sense is the thing that takes authority, and that we obey the gospel rather than the government. If government actions are causing suffering to the vulnerable, then they are against God and his ways, and so we must act against them in the South African context. So then what about our context? Should we be involved in civil disruption? I can't decide that for you. Genuinely, I think it's a matter of conscience. It's something I wrestle with myself. And I certainly wouldn't be so arrogant as to decide the matter for you. I think we all need to think about those passages of Revelation 13 and Romans 13. Where do we think our state is now? What do we think is the most appropriate response to the climate emergency? Where will we play our part in the toolkit of bringing about change? But I do want to finish with this quote from Carmody Gray, a good friend of mine from, uh, well, she was at Durham University, though I believe she's moved on. And this is as much of a challenge to myself as to anyone else. A society which has so spectacularly <coughs> failed to heed the message coming out of the UN about the climate future is a society in which the same minority have only civil resistance left to them. Civil resistance is indeed a politics of desperation. That kind of politics is never justified, except when the times are desperate. In the wake of the last two IPCC reports, it's impossible to understand how anyone could disagree that they are, that these times are desperate. 
So I want to leave you with that quote and also to say that if you want to read more about this and more about the different actions that we can take and the, the theology that underlies us thinking about environmental care and, and taking care of other people, acting for justice, then do, I won't go through all of these, but I've got a whole range of books and resources over on the table there that will be really useful for you. Some at an amazing discount too, <laughs> can I say, just for those of you who like a bargain. And do come and see me afterwards <coughs> and we can chat and I can explain a bit about more about what is there. But I hope that's helpful to give a bit of an underlying framework for our discussion this evening. Thank you. start with Sue, and then we'll go to Martin, and then to Sharon, okay? So, um, sort of, yeah, what do you want to share at this point, having heard Ruth's um, talk? Well, <coughs> I want to begin by sharing my apology to Ruth, I think, because there was a time about, I don't know, two years ago, <laughs> when <laughs> she gave a talk to a large audience. I went up to her afterwards, and I said, you're leading everyone astray. It's direct action we've got to be involved in. And here she gives us this wonderful talk, which um, I don't really know what I can add to, actually, Ruth. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I would just take up, I suppose, the um, point about um, direct action is very uh, 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 civil disobedience, let me say civil disobedience for a Christian is a very extreme thing for a Christian to do. Our default position must always be um, obedience to the state in the sense that um, uh, uh, God gives us these structures, if you like, to enable society to flourish. I mean, we don't want to live in an anarchist, at least most of us don't, um, anarchist society. But um, uh, extreme situations, like the extreme situation of climate catastrophe that is looming, does demand an extreme response, I believe. And therefore, I do see breaking the law as extreme and as warranted and required of some people to flag up what is going on, which is that most people, quite understandably, I don't, I'm not critical about this, quite understandably, cannot absorb what is going on. They are in a state of denial. We're all in a state of denial, because in a way we couldn't function, we couldn't get up in the morning, go about our business, if we weren't in a position of needing to deny the reality of the climate catastrophe that is looming. But uh, we need to wake up and do something that will attract the attention of the people who are not able to begin to grasp it and, more importantly, try to get the government to change course. Now, we are only a tiny speck in the whole um, 
seen uh, in the world, and people often say this, you know, what about China? <laughs> well, you and I can't do anything about China much, but we can do something in our own society, and every society requires activists, I think, to uh, sound the alarm, say, wake up, we have to change now. Now, at nearly 82, it's not going to probably be a, a, a absolutely affecting me in the way that it will affect people's children and grandchildren. But this is something that I can do and must do, therefore, and feel called to do. And I think it's about what God asks of us uh, individually. We're all going to be needing to respond individually to this, and as Ruth has <laughs> rightly said, we will have different responses and need to follow where God is leading each of us. Thank you very much. Um, yes, please pass the mic to Martin. Martin, what, what's your, what are your reflections at this point? When I accepted the invitation to come onto this panel, I, I, I wondered whether this was one of those invitations where you're being led into a trap oh. <laughs> that, that, that the topic is such that how could you possibly disagree with a, a statement that, that on some levels just has a, a motherhood dimension to itself. Of course, where there is injustice in the world, where there is a disobedience to God's will, the Christian is under a moral obligation to bend the knee not to the state, but to God. But what concerns me is that Rather glibly, not our speaker tonight, but rather glibly a whole range of people seem to, to throw things together uh, and justify their actions without properly working through their theological underpinning of why they're doing what they're doing. I think, it, I think it's very dangerous to simply describe um, an illegal act involving disruption uh, as simply a, an awkward event when that stops emergency uh, services getting to where they need to be or where people aren't able to get to hospital when they need to be. Disruption is, is, is a very glib way of describing those sorts of actions. The default position for both um, Protestant, Evangelical and, and Catholic over many centuries, of course, was uh, that one's responsibility was to um, obey the state. Clearly, in the last cent century and a half, uh, there has been quite a change. New thinking, both in, in Protestant and Catholic thinking, now looks at things in a much more di direct action viewpoint. And, of course, the movement in South Africa against an evil regime and an evil lifestyle was clearly the imperative for the, for the Christian gospel. But I think the important thing which I would pick up from, from our speaker's comments is that both leading thinkers in the evangelical term and certainly in the current uh, Catholic social teaching is that it must be about um, what is sometimes described as social civility it is, are we engaging in this in a way that we still respect other people, both the people who are affected by our actions, but also, and this is something that I think is increasingly absent from our public debate, that those who we are blaming for these actions are actually not necessarily the incarnation of evil. And I think there is a real danger that we engage in that sort of, of uh, shadow boxing setting up uh, straw men. So, so I think the notion of, of, of us being able to figure out are our actions justified? Have we tried all other actions? Um, are very important. And there is a, a very powerful article that's been written by a, an American Jesuit, Drew Christensen, uh, in, in 2012 at Notre Dame uh, Journal of, of Social Ethics, in which he talks about the need to distinguish between what he calls civility action and, and social, uh, so, uh, it's called social inclusion action, is, is are you first of all 
motivated in the correct way? Are you considering the consequences of your action? And secondly, are you using all of the courses of, of, of sources of action that can be taken within the legal process or the political process? And I think that it is important that no matter what the causes you are, you are defending or promoting, that you don't think that you have an exclusive view on the moral high ground. And I think that absence of, of, uh, of dialogue and respect is something that is deeply disturbing in our, in our current climate. And of course, that's fueled by both populism of left and right, um, who seek to demonize the other side. And I think that we don't help the, the dialogue <laughs> if we are seeking to create demons rather than to seek to find out how we can implement God's will. Thank you very much. There's a lot of helpful points there. Sharon, where do you come? <laughs> I suppose picking up on what Martin said, I think motivation for, for me is, is key in this, and that came through in what Ruth said um, as well. Um, I'm vicar of St. Mary's Eco Church. Um, sometimes think of us as St. Mary's in the wilderness, and that will come into this a little bit. Um, for us, the, one of the formative moments was seeing um, the world as if we have an attachment disorder with the land and other parts of nature to the point where we don't even understand ourselves sometimes as nature ourselves. So we have a really unhealthy relationship and for me that's key is how do we go about healing that unhealthy relationship we care about the countryside that is distant from us um, and needs to stay unchanged and perfect which is always a warning sign and then the land under our feet we treat like rubbish so you've got one seriously unhealthy relationship there how do we create spaces for healthier relationships? And I suppose here as a theologian, I start a bit, a bit like your triangle, Ruth, but I think about it in the shape of the cross um, with each other across our differences and respecting our differences, therefore, is really important. Um, that crossbar of the cross, and the church has often been good at that. Um, our relationship uh, with God as humans, the upward thrust of the cross, the church is often attended to that. But we have, until fairly recently, often completely neglected the downward thrust of the cross into the land. Despite the fact John 3.16, which is the most quoted verse, isn't God so loved white middle class humans. It's God so loved the cosmos. It's not even God so loved the world. It's God so loved the cosmos, God sends God's son. So that's the place where we start from as St. Mary's Eco Church, is how do we create spaces for healthy relationships with each other across our differences, with God and with the land and other parts of nature. And as part of that, I think for us it's been important to St. Mary's in the wilderness to not necessarily point our finger at other people, but to point our finger at ourselves and to think how do we respond and change our own lives. Um, within that, I think all of us actually pointed out that um, there are all sorts of different ways of responding to the challenges that are uh, facing us. Um, we've talked about a toolkit. Um, the way I see it is um, the world of ecosystems. So there are all sorts of different responses that we can be offering to the challenge ahead of us. And Paul talks about the body of Christ, which is kind of the ultimate ecosystem, you could say. Um, as an Old Testament scholar, I would look at the prophets and see there was never one way of responding to a crisis situation. There's all sorts of ways. Um, so for instance, um, the book of Hosea is all about relationship. And I would say that's where St. Mary's Eco Church is, is looking at that relationship. We have Amos, which is looking at um, absolute certain extinction. Uh, we have Extinction Rebellion and Christian Climate Action. Um, there's those who point the finger at leaders, so Micah, or other nations like China, so the prophet Habakkuk. So in those prophetic texts, there's all sorts of responses. But one of the things I'm becoming passionate about is where is the response of bringing in the law? Um, because all of those prophetic texts, and also particularly Jeremiah, would bring in the law and use legal language. So where are we doing that? As the church, 
um, but also taking notice of people like Client Earth who have bought one share in Shell to take them to court, for instance. So how are we using our legal systems as well as um, civil disobedience? Um, listening to Ruth um, uh, this evening, though, I was also thinking of Moses, who is a prophet. And of course, there's that Sabbath as resistance, the putting down of the tools of work as resistance in response to um, what is seen in the world. Um, so there might my starting responses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, can I, just, um, I know you're gonna maybe ask the panel one more question, and I'm gonna suggest that while you do that, and we still listen to you intently, um, <laughs> that people might be thinking of their own questions and so we're just going to go around with these bits of paper, we're a bit old school at the moment. Um, and uh, if you want to write down a question, please do. The paper will go round and keep going round and pick them up. So, sorry to interrupt. Do. I'm going to take a sight of the same thing Great. on the same wavelength. Um, thank you, panel. Thank you, everyone. Um, there are some themes emerging, I think. Um, there's something about um, our motivation analyzing that, isn't there? There's, there's also a theme across speakers about not, not demonizing others, but also recognizing that there are a variety of ways that people will respond as a matter of conscience. And those sound all very helpful things. Ruth, I wanted to ask you, you, you might want to come back on things that the other management have said, but the, the, the Carmody Gray quote, what, which has disappeared, but I've got it here. Um, what, what drew you to it? What, what did you like about it and what challenged you about this? Here, if I put it here. There you go. You might remind me. Uh, let me say it again. The society, which is... Oh, no, you've got it on there. That's great. Um, well, one, what drew me towards it was because I know Carmen. <coughs> and she's a uh, man... She's a fantastic scholar and thinker, um, and so I have a lot of respect for the things that, that she says. Um, and this was in an article that she wrote, I can't now remember, in what it got quite widely read. Um, and I thought it was a, a really help. I, it picks up really on what Sue said, that, that our default is being law-abiding. Um, and we only get to the place of civil disruption, of peaceful civil disruption, when we are desperate. And I like her, what Car that Carmody says, this kind of politics is never justified, except when the times are desperate. And so it's thinking for ourselves, it's asking that question really, how desperate are these times and therefore what is our response. So I think it's very similar to what Sue said. So it, it, this isn't something that you do lightly, and it's not something that, that we want to do, and it's not our default <coughs> position. But it challenges us to think where we've got to as a society. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Martin, do you want to comment on, on that quote at all? Um, I, I was just particularly struck, I mean, it's this sentence, that kind of politics is never justified, except when times are desperate. Why is that politics not ordinarily justified? What's, what's your, your thinking there? Please pass the microphone. Uh, yes, you need the microphone. I think the, the comment that uh, it's never justified, except when the times are desperate, is because the danger is that so many causes and movements, and it's not worth talking about this in the context of climate change, but there are other movements and agitations in our society at the moment that quite clearly are being pursued by people with very justifiable, legitimate and sincere motivation, but there are also forces at work who seek to engage in those movements for other ideological reasons. And so therefore I think the importance is how have we exhausted not just the political process, but I think the political process is, 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 is political, but also the legal process. So that the idea of, of becoming a 
disruptive shareholder um, is important. I think, for example, that quite frankly, the Church of England has been woeful with its uh, involvement in ethical investment. And I know in the Diocese of Southwark, our last synod meeting, there was a uh, there was quite a, a strained debate as to how we were going to engage in ethical investment. So we did a very good Anglican thing of kicking into the long grass to discuss it another time. But the simple fact is that, that before the Church of England should be lecturing other people about how they behave, we should, they should get their own house in order. And therefore I think that uh, there is a far more uh, justifiable argument that um, institutions Church and people can use the structures of corporatism, the legal process, um, to use those tools to effect change. And I just don't think we've done that particularly well. And Bishop Harry's of Oxford was arguing this case decades ago. And in reality, we, we occasionally make a, a, a statement about we're going to disinvest from X company, but, but we're not using that extraordinary portfolio of investment to make real change. So I think that the, the question of the kind of politics that's ne never justified um, is that because there are, we are in a democratic uh, and legal process, unlike any countries, of course, um, like South Africa was, where we do <coughs> have opportunities to use the political process and the legal process, we should do. Thank you very much. Sham, do you want to say a bit more about your, your thinking, your role in thinking about using the law? Which we, ha we had another gathering, didn't we? Yeah, so we have a monthly thing called the Eco Chamber, which is designed as an antidote to the echo chambers of the world. Um, and for that, client earth came to speak, um, which was amazing. And also um, somebody, uh, Suresh Mystery, who works for Alquity, which is a um, sustainable investment um, firm. And both of them came to think about how do we use our legal and financial structures um, to respond to the situation we're in, not as the only way of responding. I think I'd want to be really clear about that. It's all about ecosystems from my perspective. But I agree with Martin. I don't think we, as the Church of England, have used all the tools that we have in our toolkit. Um, we have representatives in the House of Lords. It's extraordinary. If you look at the resources that we have, and the finances that we have, our pension fund is a massive tool. Um, and people take it seriously, like Client Earth, one of the reasons they spoke at our eco chamber is they, they came to me and said, look, um, you don't realize the power that the Church of England has as an ethical voice um, within places um, like the Stock Exchange, that actually if, if um, the Church of England had joined with Client Earth um, in supporting taking um, shelter court, the courts would have taken it much more seriously at the moment they kicked it out. But they, they will find a way back because they're resilient Client Earth. But I think it's absolutely something we can be doing as well as all the other responses that we can. Thank you very much. I want Sue to have a, a, another chance to speak. Before I come to you, audience, for questions, I hope there are some questions bubbling up. Um, Sue, I know that you've, I mean, you can say whatever you want to say at this point, but I know you've, you've very much been on the, the front line of, of civil disobedience, direct action, and, and, and you've, you've paid for it in terms of being arrested a number of times. What, tell, tell us a bit about what have you wrestled with in doing those acts? I'm sure it's not been... It's not, it, it, it's, it's extremely challenging in lots of ways. What, do, what has been most challenging about it? What have you kind of seen through it? I will come to that, Bishop Martin, but I just want to make one comment about this, um, I, this either or, uh, which creeps into these sorts of discussions. Um, I spend a huge amount of my, my time writing letters to the government and to the opposition and to my MP, um, <coughs> going, going writing to um, getting divestment to happen in my pension funds and so forth. Um, <coughs> and um, it's not an either or, we need to all do that as well. <laughs> um, but 
there is a place, I think, for um, uh, doing this uh, civil disobedience because it's a sort of shock tactics. And yes, it is challenging. Um, the first time is always the most challenging, I suppose, because you don't know what's going to happen, being arrested and so forth. But it opens up, this is the other thing I want to say, about having dialogue with people. It opens up the most wonderful opportunities of having dialogue with the police, with the detention people that you're taken to, and preeminently, of course, when you go to court, with the court being able to witness to the truth in court is a huge privilege. And I want to make it clear that this also, for me as a Christian, means witnessing to my Christian faith in court. I always start by saying I do this because I, I believe I'm being obedient to God. I do this because it's his creation that I'm trying to save. I do this because when I was ordained a priest, I made a solemn promise to protect the poor. And the poor are suffering grievously in the global south at the moment. I can say all that and much more in the court. And <coughs> one can talk to judges in a way in which you never get this sort of opportunity. So we're trying to influence the legal system, influence the judiciary, influence the government, and indeed, going back to the church, the divestment of the church, I think, which is only three dioceses now that are invested in fossil fuels. Christian climate action have been to many dioceses and done direct actions in cathedrals uh, and, and general synod, which have also divested, holding up banners saying, no faith in fossil fuels at the end of the service. And this is powerful stuff, and it's worked. Thank you very much for that. It's a really, really fascinating conversation with, with some really interesting nuance. Now, I want to um, give you, the audience, a chance to um, ask questions. You may have comments or reactions to things you've heard. Um, jo, have you... going to read some of them out. It's a bit arbitrary, I'm afraid, so a bit, bit, um, forgive me if I just uh, pluck ones that I like. <laughs> if you were in government, I, I, my, my criteria of this is if they're short and succinct, by the way. If you were in government, what would you do first to implement positive change? <laughs> I know this is very simplistic, but I would stop all new licenses for fossil fuel exploration and extraction. Sue agreed with that. So, so Martin or, or Sharon, do you want to comment? I think that would be the first place, really, is to, to stop those licenses. Um, after that, <laughs> I think it would be about um, it's about education um, and about our relationship with the land. Um, so the way I think about it is when I was in hospital with my smallest uh, children, my, in fact it was the other ones, with my twins when they were born, I got really reliant on watching the machines telling me whether those twins were all right and really reliant on the doctors um, as well. Um, when I went home with them, I therefore had no confidence whatsoever and found and really struggled for a little bit as a mum. With my second pregnancy, which wasn't twins, I was back in there and she was born at 32 weeks and so we were in the hospital for a month and I learned not to look at the machines and not to listen to the doctors, but when the machine went beep, I looked at the baby. <laughs> and I could, and checked whether she was breathing, whether she was the right colour, and I went back a much more confident mother. I think we've lost that. Science is absolutely brilliant, and politicians and um, protest groups, etc., all really important, but we each need to learn individually to notice the world around us and each other and whether it looks healthy or not. So something about a right relationship with technology. Sorry. 
with, with technology, but also one of the things we do, for instance, which I see as a bit of a prophetic sign act, is we're there in the park every Sunday, simply saying, here's the ecosystem of our park. Um, last week was frost, we've had moss, we've had parakeets. What are these different parts of the ecosystem bringing to our park? How do we notice whether they're healthy or not? And how are we part of the ecosystem? So it's not just all about me and take and what can I get out of this, but how am I part of something bigger? So doing it in smaller things, but hopefully beginning to point towards a way of seeing the whole of life, because we're part of ecosystems and our, our behaviour matters. Thank you. Martin, um, if you were in government, <laughs> what would you do first? What's your take on that? Quite simple. Um, I would make Zach Goldsmith the Secretary of State, give him the power to implement the policies over which he resigned when they were reversed. Thank you. Another question. Very good, very good answers, I think. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of questions which kind of get at the, uh, at the um, same thing. Uh, first, I, I, would have, I would have more faith in the protesters if I felt their actions were 100% carbon neutral. Do you agree, asterisk, Emma Thompson flew 6,000 miles to attend a demo. A similar question is, am I justified in protesting and taking part in civil disobedience if I haven't reduced my own carbon footprint to zero? Are we all hypocrites? Sue. So. <laughs> of course we're all hypocrites. <laughs> we can't possibly have reduced our carbon footprint to um, zero. We need to do our best about it, of course. We need to do absolutely everything we can and, and sacrificial things too in our own lifestyle. But that's never going to cut the mustard. The only thing that we can do is get the, the carbon emissions and the methane emissions to come down. This is an emergency. I'm glad for all the things you're doing. I wish we'd done them 30 years ago. We haven't got time we need to do it as well, but we haven't got time to rely on that. This is an absolute emergency. So the thing we've got to do is to, uh, can you think of anything madder than going and digging up more fossil fuels when we cannot burn any more that we've got now? We have to stop burning all fossil fuels now. Then we decide how we deal with the consequences of that decision but it's not the other way around. Thank you. Ruth, do you have a, a thought on that, our own personal practice and, and, and then civil disobedience? Yeah, uh, we, we have to do everything that we can in every area that we can. So I try my hardest to live as low carbon a lifestyle as I can, but I, you know, I live in a normal house in the social and economic system that we have in our country. So of course I still use fossil fuels in order to exist, but that doesn't detract from us trying to do everything that, that we can. So we don't need to get to zero in our own lifestyles before we have any legitimacy to take action in other ways. But it is a really good question because because I realized sort of many years ago when I was taking political action and uh, supporting some organisations with my money. And I realised that actually I can't call on governments and businesses to take action if I'm not taking action as well. So, so let's do that together. But as you do that, don't get into the guilt trap of thinking I'm, I'm not perfect, therefore I can't do anything else. And also don't fall into the media trap because it's one of the things that some sectors of the media like to do particularly is to highlight any apparent or potential inconsistencies. And with the Emma Thompson story, actually if you looked beneath the surface, it actually wasn't the case that she'd flown 6,000 miles or what have you in order to do a demo, but, but it created this wonderful headline that people fell for. If you haven't seen the film Don't Look Up, then, then watch it. Because it's a just, uh, it's a brilliant expose, really, of media tactics. So do do watch Don't Look Up. It's uh, it's not the best of films, but from that perspective, it's really interesting. Thank you. Do we have more questions? Yes. Excellent. 
are you less questioned? So the ultra low emission zone extension was a practical policy implemented by London's government. Why do you think most people are against it? Martin, do you want to start? I think that most people are against it because it impacts on them directly and are not convinced that, that it is being introduced for, any, for a, an ecological reason, but rather it's being introduced to raise money for TFA. So, so, so the, it's about the authenticity of the policy. A point you made earlier. Yes. Anyone else want to comment on that? Uh, Sue and yeah. uh, I totally agree. I mean, it impacts on people individually. The, the point is in all this, if you do a poll of people's views about the climate and what to do, everybody, well, a high percentage of people feel that something should be done about the climate crisis. If you make specific policies that impact them personally, everybody's against it. And of course, that's human nature. We're going to have to deal with that in some way if we're going to try and at least slow this catastrophe down. Um, speculative one, this one. Have the panel members heard of the Climate Majority Project? And if so, do they regard it as a useful and valid response to the climate emergency? Well, that's interesting. If you haven't heard of it, then... Uh, <laughs> Project is a new um, organization which is just starting up, which tries to harness the desire and energy of the majority of the people in this country who do care about this issue and who want to help but don't feel able for whatever reason to be activists. So, what they're doing is asking people to um, get involved in their workplace, their school, their church group <clears throat> in order to see how they can try and change things and harness the movement together. So the movement is coming together at the moment. They're focusing on climate distress and their people. If anybody wants to look them up, just Google the Climate Majority Project. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And, and if I can just make a, a shameless plug, in Lent I'm leading um, a series of walks around Southwark Diocese pilgrimage for the climate. And I think um, there, a little bit like you were saying, it's to try and draw in people who might not see themselves as activists, but to do something constructive together. Um, yes. I just had a response to the Euler's question. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> took me a while to get there. I think, for me, it's a little microcosm of what is happening globally. So we do need to think about transition. If we expect to get from naught to 60 just like that, it is going to um, impact on the most vulnerable people first. And those of us who are more privileged will almost always be all right, but changing things quickly doesn't help anybody. I think even Sadiq Khan now, if he were asked would he go about ULAS differently, I think he would have done and there'd have been more time to phase out those cars so that the more vulnerable weren't impacted. Um, theologically, I'm reminded of um, the, the testing um, of, of Jesus in the wilderness, um, where everything that he's tested about are things that actually Jesus will eventually do, <laughs> um, but there are shortcuts there, not going the, um, the, the, the proper way about it and the respectful way about it. So I would say that's what we need to be thinking of. And with that, I would think of the book of Isaiah, which is all about how do you transition from here to there and do that um, with the best of motivations and thinking about how we're part of an ecosystem. And so everything we do, even for the best of reasons, will impact on others. And how do we get there together? Thank you. Another question. Is it more difficult to justify civil disobedience when we live in a generally free and democratic society 
as compared with a totalitarian, totalitarian and undemocratic society. Does that make a difference? Yeah, really. I don't think it makes a difference to whether or not it's justifiable, but it does make a difference to the price that's paid for partaking of the actions. Um, and um, I'm very aware, as we have this discussion, I think, of colleagues who live in some Latin American countries where it's quite a different matter to take to the streets. And in general, um, protest uh, environmental activists uh, is, is a dangerous thing to do in a way that it's not, and hopefully not yet, dangerous here. I, I know in the Philippines, talking with someone from there, there have been a number of deaths recently, and that again, in Latin America, there are deaths there from people who are trying to protect particular areas of rainforest or stand up for indigenous people. So yeah, it doesn't necessarily change the justification, but it definitely adds that extra dimension. And it's something for us to give thanks for, that we are in a society where we are able to do this, uh, recognizing that it's a society where our rights are being more squeezed as well through recent laws that the government has brought in. And we, it's something we need to keep up. Uh, Yes, there was, a, there was another question which said, would the panel comment on the recent moves by the government to make peaceful process for protest more difficult? Well, I was wondering to bring Sue in, because obviously people have in this country paid a high price for their civil disobedience. What, what's your take on this civil disobedience here or, or overseas? Yes, well, I, of course I agree with Ruth that we're privileged in this country in that we do still have the um, rights uh, that we have through the Convention of Human Rights, which has changed into the Human Rights Act in this country. Um, however, these um, liberties are being eroded, without a doubt. The Policing and Crimes Act last year and the Public Order Act last year has made it much more difficult to have a ordinary peaceful protest about anything. And um, so we should flag this up, as we do now in court with judges, um, that this is a dangerous move to take away these, or to so limit these rights that they become almost meaningless. Um, but what I simply would say is that uh, we, we must not take our eye off the ball in all Whatever, I, I have a little book written here about all this, and I repeat continually, whatever it takes, whatever the cost for a Christian, we have to keep doing this. So it may come to the point where, I mean, it certainly has come to the point where some people are put in prison for a few weeks just because a judge has said that they mustn't talk about their motivation for doing what they do. And one's just taken the uh, oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and then immediately prevented from doing so. And they have bravely gone to prison. And this has to be noted and opposed. And, but we have to keep on keeping on. Thank you. Now we are getting towards the end of our time. I think I've got one more. Yeah, and it's about anger. How can we reduce anger from the public when civil disobedience affects them negative, negatively, i.e. just being a bit late for work? Sharon and then Ruth. Well, I don't know Yeah, and Sue as well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sharon, Sue, and then Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> it's all falling apart now. <laughs> well, um, it's a very interesting experience, really. It's, it's a very scary experience to sit on the streets and being abused and shouted at and 
dragged away, if possible, by some people. But it's also an interesting and lovely experience to engage in some dialogue with people so that you reduce the anger and you enable that person and you to find a meeting ground. And um, I have some examples, again, in my little book, which talks about that, and that's the task. It's dialogue, is something that Martin uh, flagged up right at the beginning. It's trying to have dialogue, which enables people to understand why one is doing this and the emergency that we're in. And um, it, can, it can be done. It can certainly be done with many people. And it's a question of uh, information very often, information and knowledge, and a human relationship. The other thing I just want to say very quickly is non-violence is at the heart of all direct action, the civil disobedience for the Christian. And it's the non-violence that is compelling to people. It's so powerful. The vulnerability and the non-violence. And many of us are elderly who do this. And I do commend this. There are a few grey hairs in the room. What, what else can you do except sit and watch stroke your cat and do your garden? No, don't do that. Come on the streets. And it's the vulnerability that you offer that is at the heart of it. Thank you. Um, I'd like to give anyone else who wants to say a word on, on this point a chance, but then I'd, I'd like to just go down the line and allow all our panelists, starting with Martin, um, finishing the group, to, to make a final comment or reflection on tonight's proceeding. But does anyone else want to speak on the anger point? I thought you might. <laughs> I'm probably not going to say what you thought I might, funnily enough. Um, what I could have said is, is about our attachment disorder and um, that actually getting, shouting at people who have an attachment disorder doesn't necessarily help that relationship and that's partly where we come from, although I have been, the one time I've been on the Daily Mail was in Trafalgar Square at the moment when it was said that there couldn't be protests, I was there to stand up for your right to protest, absolutely. Um, when it comes to anger, one of the images I'm really struck by is Joel's image of locusts. So I didn't know this until I became an eco vicar. Um, but there is no difference between a locust and a grasshopper. Um, locusts and grasshoppers are the same thing. A locust is what happens when grasshoppers lose resources and they panic slightly, they get into groups and a hormone is set off and they grow wings and through that they become locusts and then they fly and decimate the places that they, um, they, they arrive at. Um, it really struck me, uh, not just in Joel, but when Isaiah says that the people are like grasshoppers. And I think we just have to be alert to that and that when resources are tight, how do we not go into those groups that then change and become quite different creatures? Thank you. So a quick final comment from each of our panellists. And apologies for the bells. I did ask them to hold off a little bit. They've done quite well. They usually start at 7 30. I think the important thing is, is what's happened is, is dialogue and discussion, not shouting. Um, 30 years ago, the most wonderful book was written by a then Jesuit priest, John Deere, called The Sacrament of Civil Disobedience. It's an extraordinary book. I brought two copies if anybody wants to have one. And uh, I would say that somehow, as Christians, seeing this as sacramental gives us a whole new window into what we're about. Thank you. Sharon? I think I said my final comment with the locusts. Okay. Um, how, do we, how do we stay alert to that, that danger and be listening to each other? Ruth? Um, so I think I would say that the key thing is that we do something from that toolkit. So please may this not just be an interesting evening that you've come to, but please may you go away and do something. Um, if you want one thing to do, contact your MP 
and say to them that in the next general election, environmental concern and the climate crisis is going to be a voting issue for you. That's something that's really simple that we can all do very easily. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think it's been a really stimulating, thought-provoking and good-mannered conversation, so I'm pleased about that. Um, thank you so much, audience, for your questions and for your listening, and thank you to our panel for all their contributions. Shall we show our appreciation? us so well this evening. Thank you. Two things you can do. Um, one is a uh, no faith in fossil fuel Lent vigil for climate justice. Uh, this Lent Christians are holding a 24 hour a day, 10 day vigil in Westminster to pray for climate justice starting on Ash Wednesday um, with a noon service at St John's Waterloo. Somebody called Ruth Valerio is helping to lead that. Um, and then uh, Bishop Martin mentioned his uh, pilgrimage walks. I I'm very keen on that. It's an opportunity, I think, for us to walk and continue this conversation. Um, and the, the one lo most local to hear is on Saturday, February the 24th, beginning in this church at 10 o'clock, and then we'll walk over Richmond Park and on to Wimbledon Common. Um, and so uh, if you want to join us then, uh, see you there. Thank you so much for coming tonight and uh, we wish you well. Uh, our next talk is on April the 24th on the subject of immigration. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Ruth's books are there. Uh, Sue's books will be on another table just here. Uh, and uh, yeah, so do, do join her. Thank you.